Good day, class. And our last topic that we had covered was the Compromise of 1850. Who got the better of the Compromise of 1850? The answer was clearly the North. California, as a free state, had tipped the Senate balance permanently against the South. The territories of New Mexico and Utah were now open to slavery on the basis of popular sovereignty. And let me get you a map of that. that. Territories of Utah and New Mexico based on popular sovereignty, but the laws of nature did not favor them becoming anything but free soil states. These are not states that require labor-intensive crops because of their lack of moisture. Most of alarm, alarming of all was the drastic new fugitive slave law. This stirred up a storm of opposition in the North. The fleeing slave could not testify in his own behalf, and he was denied a jury trial. These harsh practices threatened to create dangerous precedents for the whites. A federal commis commissioner who handled the case would receive $5 if the runaway was freed, and $10 if he was not, an arrangement which strongly resembled a bribe. Freedom-loving Northerners who aided the slave escape were liable for heavy fines and jail sentences. They might be ordered to join the slave catchers, and this possibility rubbed salt into old sores. So savage was this man-stealing law that it touched off an explosive chain reaction in the North. Many shocked Moderates, hitherto passive, were now driven into the swelling ranks of the ab abolitionists. And this is where we had left off. The Underground Railroad now steps up its timetables. Here you have a placard posted. Caution, colored people of Boston. One and all, you are hereby respectfully cautioned and advised to, advert, to avoid conversing with the watchmen and police officers of Boston. For since the recent order of the mayor and aldermen, they are employed, oh, empowered to act as kidnappers and slave catchers, and they have already been actually employed as employed in kidnapping, catching, and keeping slaves. Therefore, if you value li your liberty and the welfare of the fugitives among you, shun them in every possible manner, and so as so many hounds and the track of the most unfortunate of your race. Keep a sharp lookout for kidnappers and have top eye open. <sighs> Here shows <laughs> slave catchers, lawyers running after the poor fugitive slave. Effects in the South of the Fugitive Slave Law. Now, here you have mobs coming after the slaves, and they must run quickly get to the north, but get even farther in many cases now than just the north. $100 reward. Run away from the subscriber on the 27th of July, my black woman named Emily, 17 years of age, and description of her, and um, depending upon which side of the Ohio River uh, you find her in, uh, $300 or a $100 reward. The Underground Railroad is not a railroad. It is many routes that were used, and not just one.
um, as these charts show very many routes to get to the north and now suddenly because the north is being required to aid in the returning of these slaves it, it's not good enough to just get to the north we must get the slaves into Canada completely out of the United States for them to succeed in their freedom. A conductor or a conductress on the Underground Railroad was someone who assisted, whether having a house along a route where they kept you, or whether someone who actually took you from one house to another house. Harriet Tubman, a very famous conductress on the Underground Railroad. After obtaining her own freedom, that was not good enough for her. She actually put herself in harm's way many, many times again to be a conductress. She went back down into the South to help lead others to their freedom. Approximately 300 other slaves she led <clears throat> in groups to their freedom. And we have postage stamps uh, commemorating her for um, what she has done for the blacks in our society. A wanted poster. At one time we had reward for up to $40,000 for her capture because of all of the money that the South lost in slaves she helped liberate. Here, quite a large band showing um, of sl slaves freeing on the Underground Railroad. A uh, old cabin um, that they have preserved and opened up for tourists to show just an example of a hiding place. Here they have a trap door built into the floor and you would have had your throw rug covering it and in coming to the house unless you actually moved the rug you would have no idea that there was a trap door there and a place for hiding slaves underneath them. And, you know, if someone came into the house and someone asked, you'd say, of course we have no slaves here. Look around you. What do you see? And if anyone even moved the rug, you would simply say, well, that's my root cellar down there where I keep things cold and preserved during the summer. Some additional hiding places. Here, if you're walking up the stairs, it simply looks like a built-in area for some things you could display. But if you pulled things apart, you've got a little area where you could shove someone through and a little hiding place in there. And then put your dishes and your pieces back up in there and who knows that you've got someone actually hiding in there. And here once again, you've got um, hiding space in there that you can see um, if you went in there, you could have someone hiding and no one would know that you had people in that crawl space in under there and behind there. A bookshelf pushed up against the wall. Once against the wall, you would have no idea that you have all this open space behind. And in there, you could have uh, quite a number of slaves hiding. Here in the attic of the home, once again, another crawl space that could hold quite a few people. A wagon, you got to get them from one location to another. You could lay them out and get quite a few 
people laid flat in this wagon. Meanwhile, you've got a false bottom here so that people could sit on top. Um, coming along, people would think you've got a whole wagon full of hay when you don't. Put your, um, here's the back of your wagon, put that on there, and no one knows that you've got people hidden in the back. The Niagara Falls Iris of yesterday says that a slave escaping from servitude, uh oh, hang on, arrived in that village on Tuesday evening and reached the ferry just in time to get into the little boat as it was preparing to start for the Canada side. You are well aware of the Niagara Falls. It is right on the border. So he crosses to the, to the Canada side. His master was on the same train in pursuit and reached the ferry only in time to see his chattel midway across the foaming waters of Niagara. We learn that the slave was last seen by his master at Cleveland, yet although both were on the same trains, the slave succeeded in eluding his vigilance and placing himself beyond pursuit. So the whole time the two were in the same locations, neck and neck, and the slave disguised himself well enough that the master never caught him. And Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, here this artist's drawing of her is the one used for the U.S. postage stamp of her. Here are actual um, photos of her a little bit later in life. She is the author of the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. And no book so infuriated the South and the North, then Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was written prior to the outbreak of the Civil War. It describes a very kind slave, Tom, and his mistreatment by the slave owners and their um, overlords, and how cruel slavery was in the South. It made many a northerner who was before in, indignant to the issues suddenly become very opposed to slavery and many southerners who felt that they were good slave owners very angry at the very raw um, portrayal of slavery in her book. And I may be wrong, but I had always heard that she was a northerner and had never actually been in the South and had merely taken her um, information from slaves that had fled north. And so many felt it was unfair for her to, this, these are people in the South, to have depicted slavery, having never even gone to the South to have observed slavery herself. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the Underground Railroad stepped up its timetables. While infuriated, northern mobs rescued slaves from their pursuers. Massachusetts, in a move toward nullification suggestive of South Carolina back in 1832 with regard to the tariff, made it a penal offense for any state official to enforce the new federal statutes. Other states passed personal liberty laws, which denied local jails to federal officials and otherwise hampered enforcement. The abolitionists rent the heavens with their protests against this man-stealing statute. Abolitionism, the word comes from to abolish. To abolish means to get rid of something. I can want to abolish cake in the United States. No one henceforth shall eat 
cake, and I will go on a campaign to abolish cake eating. And no more will sh we produce cakes. Shall anyone buy cakes? Shall anyone eat cakes? Um, so to abolish something, you can abolish anything you want. But when we talk in the United States about someone being an abolitionist, the big thing that comes to mind, because for so many years, the prominent issue in this country of what was wanting to be abolished was slavery. Yes, we had the temperance movement where people want, were wanting to abolish the drinking of alcohol and whatnot, but nothing was to the same degree as the issue of slavery. And so when someone talks about, in the United States, an abolitionist, which is someone who is wanting to abolish something, that always refers to someone who is wanting to abolish slavery. So yes, technically, an abolitionist is someone who wants to abolish anything. But in United States speaks, um, it means someone who wants to abolish slavery. Beyond question, the Fugitive Slave Law was an appalling blunder on a the part of the South. No single irritant in the 1850s was more persistently galling to both sides, and none did more to awaken in the North a spirit of antagonism against the South. The Southerners in turn were embittered because the Northerners would not, in good faith, uphold them and execute the law, the one real immediate gain from the Great Compromise. Slave catchers, with some success, redoubled their efforts. And Millard Fillmore, the man, he will serve out the term of Zachary Taylor. Oops, that just went to, hang on. There, we had skipped them, that one. Um, the Whigs do not have the best of success with their presidents. The first, they get two of them actually into office as president. And then they technically have two as vice presidents that make it in. First, we had William Henry Harrison, who lasted 31 days, uh, dies of pneumonia. And his vice president... John Tyler, ah, ha, 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 ha. remember he was a Democrat in Whig's clothing. His whole life he had been a Democrat, but he didn't like the autocratic tendencies of um, Jackson, so he had joined the Whig fold on every issue. He cited it with the Democrats and against the Whigs once he was in office. Oh, they hated him. Now they got <clears throat> Zachary Taylor into office. He lasts 16 months and dies. And they end up with Millard Fillmore from New York. So you had this Southerner from Louisiana, slave-owning Southerner, and you end up with a New Yorker, his vice president, <sighs> to finish out his term. And he and his wife, Abigail Powers Fillmore. Um, such a dark background, you can hardly see where the picture begins and leaves off, but him in a little bit earlier life and in later life. Some New York statues of him. He was a New York president. We've had a number of New York presidents. Another one of him and his wife. First wife, I should say. But she was first lady. She had health issues. Um, New York presented them with this fine carriage, um, and he dressed quite to the nines, and 
while he was vice president, it was said because old rough and ready Winfield um, Zachary Taylor was known for his lack of resplendency in attire that the vice president looked more presidential than the president did. But um, his wife, Abigail, had issues with health. And so his daughter, Phil, um, the Fillmore's daughter, Mary, actually helped her quite a bit in her first lady duties. And two pictures of their daughter, Mary Abigail Fillmore, and their son is Millard Powers Fillmore. Takes on the um, mother's maiden name. She, his, his mother is Abigail Powers Fillmore. So the son is Millard Powers Fillmore. And the son is just a spitting image of his father and the daughter is a spitting image of the mother you know it's really hard to tell if it wasn't documented that this is the son and this is the daughter versus earlier pictures of the mother and the son they look um, so much like their parents unfortunately she will die um both mother and daughter um, die uh, right after the, um, er, I can't remember if she dies while he's still in office right at the end, but the wife dies right after he leaves office, um, or they both die right after he leaves office. He then marries, um, five years later, Carolyn Carmichael McIntosh Fillmore, who was a very wealthy widow, and um, she brought quite a bit of wealth to the marriage. And you will have to read in on D2L in the um, biography of Fillmore a little interesting tidbit about when they got married, the prenuptial that got put together. His birthplace in New York and one of his houses, um, when he marries a second wife, they have a house uh, in the city, so this would have been one of his houses when he, with his first wife. And his tombstone. And while president, um, she was first lady. He doesn't marry the second wife until after he is president. She never, the second wife never was first lady, and she does not pass until after he leaves the presidency. So she is first lady the whole time he is president. And as you can see, um, spaced uh, in the same territory, same uh, cemetery, uh, just a little bit of distance apart. And we do have a couple <laughs> U.S. postage stamps of Fillmore. Um, this one is actually a foreign one. Please, on D2L, we have information on Harriet Tubman that you will need to read for test number three. Don't forget this. There's a lot of D2L reading. Get moving on this. Also, another biography of Sojourner Truth. She got involved in quite a few issues, not just of black issues, but also of women's suffrage um, movement issues. So please read about Sojourner Truth on D2L. I was thinking there was one. Other. Okay, it'll come later. I got another picture of Sojourner Truth with Lincoln. Here, uh, Frederick Douglass. He is a leading black abolitionist. Read about him for, D, for the test on D2L. 
And we also have postage stamps on Frederick Douglass, pictures of him younger and later in life. Ah, see, I knew I should have put this one with with her. I, Cabinet photo of Lincoln showing Sojourner Truth, a Bible presented by colored people of Baltimore to him. And the Dred Scott case, you will read about this on D2L. He himself did not sue for his freedom, but the abolitionists will use him as a test case to go through the Supreme Court. Individual cases are being brought personally to the court, not to the Supreme Court, but to lower courts and are winning. And they said, we don't want to constantly, one by one, bring cases to lower courts. We need the Supreme Court to decide once and for all. What was happening was slaves were being taken to free territory. And they were then saying afterwards, if I'm living in free territory, I'm not a slave anymore. I am free and suing in court for their freedoms. And so the abolitionists take the Dred Scott case to the Supreme Court. And we will come to that a little bit later. Well, what about Dred Scott himself? An article on D2L about him and... Uh, what happened with the case, and did he, because of the case, end up ultimately being free or not? His wife, Harriet, and they had two daughters, Eliza and Lizzie. Find out, did he end up free or did he end up slave, based on the Supreme Court case of Dred Scott? And burial place of Dred Scott. And in the paper, his um, obituary, Dred Scott died. This rather celebrated personage died in this city on Friday after long illness of what is termed Negro consumption. Now, consumption is consumption. I don't know how Negro consumption is different than any other. This is lung ailment, to tuberculosis. Um, um, Dredd was free for some time prior to his death. Um, that's your answer. Having been manumitted by his owner, the Honorable Mr. Chafee, not long after the decision rendered in his case before the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court determined he was not free. He was a possession, and possessions cannot sue in court. Citizens can sue in court, and slaves are not citizens. They are possessions. So please read the Dred Scott case. John Brown, picture of him in his younger days, later days. He will get heavily involved with the case of Bleeding Kansas. What is Bleeding Kansas? Well, we will soon find out. He ultimately will gain fame with his attack on Harper's Ferry. And he will be executed for it. John Brown, his wife, and some children. He has many children. I do not know if this is all of his children <laughs> or part of his children. He has quite a large family. But here, showing him after he has been surrendered and captured at Harper's Ferry. Once again, very artistic um, element here kissing a black child as he is leaving on his way to be executed. And the hanging of John Brown for treason. You don't take over a federal arsenal 
hoping then that the southern blacks will rise up and you'll distribute the weapons from the arsenal and cause all manner of chaos in the south. They did not appreciate his efforts. So please read about John Brown in D2L. Oops. And we will pick up the election of 1852 in the next segment. <sighs> Goodbye.